Hi, everyone. Oops. All right, looks like we're ready to go here. Um, just going to take this out, see how I do with this. Uh, I want to thank Kafka for inviting me here, Gordon for spending the last week with me, um, and everybody here for showing up to listen about uh, biennials. Um, I wanted to, before I begin, just sort of take a survey. How many people here have been to a biennial? Hands raised. Okay, so you guys, there's like a couple people who haven't been to a biennial. Is there anybody here who is like, you know what? I don't really know what a biennial is. Tell me Patty Johnson. Hands up. Oh, good. Okay, great. <laughs> So there's a couple people here who want to know what our biennial is. So um, just sort of briefly, an art biennial is usually comprised of like hundreds if not thousands of artworks. Um, they span mediums, paintings, sculptures, installation, you name it, it's in a biennial. Uh, also biennials uh, are showcases for contemporary art and uh, they can either span cities or individual institutions. And uh, the, the, thing, the, um, the most important thing to know about a biennial is that it happens every two years, except when it happens every three years, then it's called a triennial, except when it happens every five years, that's when it's called a quinquennial. So we just wrap all these things together and we call them biennials even though they happen at various intervals. But the point is, is that they're big art shows and events and we all look forward to them. And a lot of times I think in the world that I'm in, I'm in we think that they're really important. So important that I, I thought I would begin this entire lecture on something that happened a couple years ago, um, 2009 in fact. Um, we'll see how far we can go without this uh, thing uh, shutting down. But in 2009, so I had been blogging for you know, four years. At this point, I had not been to the Venice Biennale. The Venice Biennale happens every two years. And this is sort of, this was the first biennial that was, that was ever made and and it's considered the most important. I had not been there and I kind of felt like, okay, you know, I'm a critic. I need to go to this thing. I should probably go to more more biennials too, but this this one I really needed to go to. So I went to the biennial. I had zero dollars. Uh, so the way that I made it to the biennial, I'm not even sure. I think actually I borrowed a bunch of money. I borrowed money from my, my two brothers and my sister to make it happen and eventually my mother had to pay my debt off. So that's, <laughs> that's how that happened and my mother happens to be in the front row so thank you very much for doing that mom. Uh, <laughs> so anyway I scrapped together all this money we had to, I couldn't even get into the city of Venice. I had to stay outside of the city because we had booked so late. And one of the things that happens with the Venice Biennale is that immediately after, there's an art fair. And this art fair happened to be the biggest art fair in, in the world at that time. So that was our Basel, Switzerland. So I knew that if I was gonna go to the Venice Biennale, I wanted to go to the art fair because also what happens, the reason they, they kind of sandwich these things so close is that all the, the artwork in a biennial is not for sale. So, um, except that it really kind of is. You can't buy it at the biennial, but you can go to the art fair a week later and buy it. So usually when you go and see the art in the, uh, in the Venice Biennale, and I'll show you some pictures later about this, um, you know, there's a, a gallerist stationed right beside the installation to tell you all about the art and how you can buy it in a week. So this is one of the sort of untalked about things that happens. Anyway, so I, I spent a bunch of time there and I just sort of scraped by and I had my plane ticket or my uh, train ticket to Switzerland. 
But I had no place to stay. And I was looking on, online, and I, the, the hostels were all booked up. There was one hotel that was available for 500 bucks a night. That was so far beyond my budget, like, I can't even tell you. So I happened to have butt called a friend of mine on the train on my way to Switzerland. And when I did that, I was like, oh my god, I'm so sorry I called you, but do you happen to know anybody in Switzerland because I happen to be a little bit screwed right now and I'm on my way? And he's like, yeah, well, I have this friend. Maybe he can help you out. He lives there. And the friend contacts me. He's like, have you looked at this hotel? I'm like, yeah, it's $500 a night. This is not happening. He's like, well, I think, I think I have a plan for you. Why don't you come visit me and my work? He's an oncologist. So I get off the train and I head to the hospital with all my suitcases and everything, and I have my intern with me. We got all our stuff, and he's like in the basement. I have to go through to meet him, like all these patients. And I come there, and he's like, I have a friend who works, he's, who works at the hospital. He's, he's also an oncologist, and he happens to have a little a motor vehicle, uh, a motor home, if you will. And he says that you can use it. And I thought, oh, this is great. So his friend walks in. His friend's name is Sven. He looks something like that. <laughs> so I'm very excited about being able to stay in this guy's motor home. He's not going to be there, sad for both of us. But <laughs> anyway, so my friend's friend the oncologist is trying to, to explain to Sven why AFC is so important. The blog that I'm doing all this criticism for is like, this is a preeminent blog. It's so important. Let me pull up the page. On the front page of the blog at that time was this. This is an image of a, a, tech, a, a Murakami image of a cowboy ejaculating. Um, and I had made fun of it because the Guardian, the Guardian this is, I think the, the piece is called Cream, and the Guardian had called this a work from Murakami's dairy-inspired works. So this was the evidence that I was a fantastic and world-changing blogger. Uh, but this did not dissuade Sven. He was very happy to uh, loan us the, uh, the vehicle, which happened to be parked outside this prison. So, <laughs> so I ended up staying in this like little motor home just behind the prison that was thankfully no longer in operation, but not the best place to stay. Sven is giving me a tour of the motor home. He's telling me like, you know what's great? Like, you can use the motor home, it, it, it's totally fantastic, uh, but we don't have any sheets or blankets. So I had to smuggle sheets and blankets out of the oncology ward to use them to sleep in. So the, you know, the, the lengths that we're going, going to for art at this point are, are getting a little absurd. I've just stolen from cancer patients. So I wasn't, this is not the proudest moment in my life, but I do need a place to stay. Sven is like, that's fine, we've got, to, we've got some extra blankets, but you know, we also have this toilet. Just keep in mind that I have to clean the toilet. So I'm like, okay, you're telling me not to shit in your toilet. <laughs> I can do that, it's not a problem. But by the time I get to Art Basel, I have not showered, I have not done anything. The intern and I are no longer talking. This is, this is, the, the stress is too much. But we get to the art fair, and here we are. It's just a big fair. And I guess where I'm going with all this is a lot of times you do, you spend a lot of time doing a lot of shit that doesn't make a lot of sense for art 
big art events. This thing, I don't know, it's like there's a giant public sculpture in front of this, in front of our Basel that looks like a flesh turd. Uh, that's what I had spent all my time trying to see. That didn't pay off. But the nice thing about these grand events is while 90% of what you do see is going to be crap, there's always something that makes it worthwhile. And there's always a good story. And it's always important, I think, to make the effort to go and see these things. Because, not, not because I got to tell you a story about Sven and like, uh, worries about shitting and that sort of thing, but because in the end, there's like, there are art and ideas at the end of all of this. And that's kind of what makes it worthwhile, in my opinion. So, um, well, this is a bit of a problem. Let's see if I can focus this. Biennials are important because they bring tourist dollars to cities. They're a little bit like the Olympics that way. Um, they encourage people to visit parts of the city they might not otherwise. They bring people together. It's a little bit like Facebook that way, except without the wars. Um, they introduce viewers to large amounts of art at once. That's great for all of us who are in the business of art. We want to see art, and this is a good, efficient way of doing it. They mix local artists with international artists, thus giving lesser known artists more exposure and greater opportunities. And they introduce opportunities for artwork evaluation through press and prizes. I think the prizes tend to be a little bit dubious, but, um, and sometimes so does the press, but as an art critic, I feel like I have to uh, put out there that criticism is, is an important part of uh, biennials. Um, but biennial, some of this stuff is like so well known. This is a cartoon by uh, Olaf Westfallen, who you can see now, like biennials can be seen as the panacea for any problem. So this is a, a village that has burned to a rubble and only art will save it. So what makes a successful biennial, um, aside from tourism, dollars and things like that. Uh, purpose. In my experience, the biennials that I've seen that have been really good have a sense of purpose. And I'm going to go over a bunch of the biennials that I've seen, and hopefully I won't bore you to death with that, but there's, there's kind of a lot of them. But, but when there is a purpose and they're connected to the context, um, you know, that basically like the the social and political moments of the time, then they resonate and they, they, um, they can have a real impact. Um, now, unfortunately, you can't see what that says, uh, but it's a, a tweet by Car uh, an artist named Carlos Mata, and he said, uh, self-doubt in 2016, my work is not good enough to impress my peers. Self-doubt in 2017, my doubt is not good enough to save the republic. <laughs> and I, I really like that tweet, and I thought it was a very good sort of just expression of s summing up the moment and like what we ask for from our right now and, and perhaps what it's capable of doing, um, its own limitations. So good management, a, a biennial that has has good kind of institutional structures behind it, that, can, that really makes a difference um, organizationally for, for a good biennial. And proper funding. This is by far and away the number one reason I see biennials fail. We try to do too much with too little. With too little. And this is a problem that I think is endemic within the art community and something that we as a whole really need to try and address because what happens is we are so invested in our field and the purpose of art and, and making something great because we believe in what it can do that sometimes we even make projects that we will them into being without their even being, they, they maybe even shouldn't exist. So I think we really have to think about 
what that means, like what, what a biennial means, what it, art events mean, and what the cost is, what the human cost is for us as a community. And finally, I'm just going to go over the biennial formats, which I did a little bit. Um, city or statewide biennials, museum-specific biennials, and biennials in name only biennials. Um, those are rather unfortunate biennials, except when they're not. So the citywide art festival is an organizing entity with that forge partnerships with uh, specific institutions, art museums, as well as city-run spaces and local businesses. Um, usually, you'll see uh, city city prominent city officials show up for these things, um, and and that's uh, that's also a characteristic. So the Venice Biennale. Um, what are the reasons the Venice Biennale is sort of consistently a show that you can't afford to miss if you are in the art world? One of them is because there's a consistent purpose. It's been around forever. We, you know, people are, or nations compete on the world stage. This is something that whether or not you think that's bullshit, it, it is something that people do and they believe in. It's inconsistently funded, which can affect the quality of the, the Venice Biennale. Um, and there's over 100 years of management um, experience, so that there, there is a kind of internal structure um, that exists there, so that when you get... These things, they sound like little things, but actually they're pretty big. Like when I get to a biennial and I can't find an artwork, it drives me up the wall, you know? The Venice Biennale, for better or for worse, you don't get lost. You get lost in Venice because that's what happens. But like they've marked the arsenal, the Giardini is fucking huge. You're not gonna miss it. They have all these permanent buildings. Like there's just because of the scale, it's very difficult for them to entirely fail. And that's I think. Um, something that I've heard said of art fairs too, but that's usually by people who are shopping. Um, so this is the biennial building. This is the arsenale. This is the arsenale empty. So this is a building that's filled with art um, for uh, this is the um, this is an installation view of the Encyclopedic Palace, 2013. This was curated by Massimiliano Gianni. I have been to every Venice Biennale since 2009, so quite a few of them. This one is by far the best one. There's nothing that even compares to it. And when I've asked people, well, what's you know what is the difference between this one and others? One thing is that the curation was really strong that year. The Encyclopedic Palace was an investigation of um, the cataloging of human knowledge. And the theme was very specific and the artwork um, within that show sh examined that subject. But also, this was a Venice Biennale that was properly funded. So Massimilia Gianna, Massimiliano Gianni had a very close relationship with somebody named Dacus Chanel. Dacus Chanel is wealthier than any of us will ever be or ever know anybody. He's just so wealthy. He lives in Greece. He bankrolled the entire thing. So see all these walls? These were walls that Gianni could afford to build. And that made a huge difference in the show because if you look at this, the architecture very often overwhelms the work. So he was able to give it a lot of ver variety. You can see here this, this architectural shape totally transforms the space. Um, this is, a, this is a, a curved wall. This is Robert Crumb, um, and, the, and he's illustrated the book of Genesis, and he illustrates pretty much every single thing. So it's a much more kind of explicit and scandalous uh, book of Genesis than we're, we're used to seeing. Um, but what was really nice about this is on the inside of this curved wall, 
that on the outside kind of reflected a certain narrative about the earth and its formation and all the rest. There's these like um, it, ancient artworks that, that also seem to tell a story about human history. So I just thought that was really beautiful and very well thought out. This is um, a piece by Walter De, Mar uh, De Maria and here you can just see the sort of variation in scale that he's done just very successfully. That Walter De Maria's piece looks beautiful, but it also looks beautiful within the, the context of what Gianni had put together. And then of course in the, in the biennial building, uh, Carl Jung's Red Book was on display. Now this is a fascinating book that um, uh, recounts and comments on the author's imaginative experiences between 1913 and 1916. Uh, and what's great, I've been to a bunch of events where there's been like a kind of famous figure. Uh, for example, on Prospect 4, which is another biennial, um, in New Orleans, they had some collages by Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong is a very, very, like a great jazz musician. He, however, was not a great artist. So there was a bunch of collages that really didn't do that much. But Carl Jung, these really captured, I think, something of the, uh, the they, they fit very well within the theme. And there was, the, uh, the works were, oh, oops, here we go. The works were, were really well executed. Now this is the biennial building ceiling within which this book lives. And then you can see that one of the pieces that Massimiliano chose has a formal relationship to the ceiling itself. So there's architectural references that the curator is drawing too. So this is why this, this show was so kind of phenomenal. So here's a, a a viewpoint of the Giardini. You guys probably remember this, David Altman at the Canadian Pavilion in 2007. If you didn't see it there, you definitely saw it in the Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, it's a phenomenal piece. It won the, uh, it, it won the award for uh, Best Pavilion at the time. So, you know, it was appropriately lauded. I personally think that David Altman has not done a work as good as this particular work since that time, his work has kind of grown increasingly fussy and enlarged with his increased budgets. Um, and this was something that I'm sure cost no small amount to produce. Meanwhile, this is the work of Gregory Farmer, um, who produced a work for the 2017 uh, uh, Biennale, and this, the Canadian Pavilion, in Gregory Farmer's uh, defense, was uh, being reconstructed at the time, so this, like, half of Pavilion is also part of, um, you know, a planned demolition. Um, but things that inform this particular work, which I know because I read the press release, is that uh, a picture of his grandfather's lumber truck um, after it had been hit by a train informed this piece, and the other was uh, Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, a picture that reminds Farmer of a fountain at the San Francisco um, Art Institute, which was important to him because the city he came out in during the Gulf War and the AIDS crisis, uh, and, and so all this informs the dilapidated, the, the deconstructed building and the, and the fountain. So this piece did not hit the mark for me. I didn't really, I don't think that you can look at this piece and get any of that information. And for me, that was, that was definitely a problem. So it, hopefully Canada will reclaim its, its uh, former glory in the future with its new pavilion and, and a new chosen artist. Um, and then this is Anne Immel's Faust. This was shown at 2007, in 2017 um, at the German Pavilion and it won the Golden Lion, so it won Best Pavilion. This piece was phenomenal. And typically I have to say that I, I usually agree with the, uh, the awards that get won, uh, that, that get awarded. This piece is an opera 
it ran four hours. So um, you can kind of come in and go out, but nobody really did it that much because you had to wait at least an hour in line to get in anyway. Um, outside the pavilion, there are Doberman pinchers. So you're supposed to be scared. The, the Doberman pinchers were actually kind of friendly dogs. Um, so <laughs> I kind of like that quite a bit. But the, um, and these performers uh, had this kind of uh, health goth aesthetic. Um, which, to my mind, furthered the idea that sensitivity and vulnerability um, don't preclude the possibility of anger and toughness. And you can see that even just in this picture. Um, what is a little bit more difficult to tell is that this woman is, um, she's kind of androgynous and she's standing on top of a, a glass floor so under, and it's elevated, so underneath you can see performers performing as well. And in the main room, there were, this picture shows one person. In the actual experience of this opera, that, that woman is just surrounded by audience members because there's a, no separation between the audience and the performers. And the performers, would come up on, from under the floor and, and stand on top of the floor, stand on ledges, but also like scurry underneath. One of the things they did is they had this like semi-transparent glass between a passageway um, where the performer would scurry underneath this passageway and that because the semi-transparent glass would reflect the images of the audience, as the performer got further away, it, it was sort of behind the semi-transparent glass, so you could see this presence, but it was kind of ghost-like. And there was something you know, very, um, it kind of almost like a church-like experience to this particular um, piece, which I thought was really incredible. Um, so getting back to this, this is the installation view of Encyclopedic pa uh, the Encyclopedic Palace in 2013. I think that looks great. I think that's a great entrance point for an exhibition. This is what they did this year. This was just like a bunch of color cubes which were supposedly activated because you uh, um, touch them and move them around. So I was a little disappointed with this particular show. So um, when I wrote my review for this, I called it uh, the Venice Biennale, an orphanage for the terminally out of touch. Um, and I'm just gonna read a little bit about this because this, you know, in terms of uh, purpose and, and kind of connecting to a particular context or not, I think is, is, um, is very important here. It was close to midnight when my phone started lighting up last week. James Comey, the head of the FBI, was fired and the freak out was almost immediate. I felt lucky to be in Italy. A buffer from the US news was necessary to maintain any kind of focus on the Venice Biennale, not to mention one's sanity, and yet, even from this distance, the turmoil back home drove home one point. Art isn't gonna save democracy. Art has no impact on Donald Trump's actions, the FBI, or any of the Republicans in the Senate or the Congress. People can call their representatives. Art cannot. All of which is to say, the art professional who believes artists are the magical unicorns who will save us all is looking increasingly silly. And so, visiting this year's Venice Biennale, Viva Art Viva, curated by Christine McKell, which begins with the premise that artists will shape the world to come, felt a little bit like walking through a United Way commercial. The upside of this, the 2017 Biennale is more diverse than many of its predecessors. The downside, diversity isn't of much value if the show is bad. So this, this, to my mind, is a good example of, of um, a show that does not kind of capture the moment of the time. Um, and speaking of biennials that failed to do that, the Berlin Biennial in 2000, 
16 had a very similar kind of failure of purpose. It felt out of touch with its times. Uh, so I'm going to read a little excerpt from um, uh, maybe some of you guys know him, R.M. Vaughn, who uh, was the art critic for the, the Globe and Mail. He also was a contributor to Art F City. Um, and he wrote about the Berlin Biennial. And what you're looking at right there is an image. This is a giant sculpture of Rhiannon with no head. Her head is painted onto her chest. Um, so he called this piece the Berlin Biennial, an act of passive compliance. Since the last Berlin Biennale, Europe has undergone a currency of a currency and debt crisis. Watch the far right political entities grow from obscure clusters of nut jobs into massive populist movements, dealt badly with the millions of people fleeing the conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa, and been subjected to terrifying and brutal acts of terrorism by all manner of extremists. In all of these crises, Berlin, the capital of the EU's richest and most politically powerful country has played a central role and keynote determining role. I can, think, I can thus think of no better way, given the circumstances, to reinforce the popular perception that contemporary art has nothing to say about the world that surrounds it than by hiring the New York City-based fashion bloggers DIS to curate the ninth edition of the Berlin Biennial. I have rarely seen such a profound case of not giving the people what they want. So many heads up so far of so many assholes. Just walk away, Berlin. Go have a strong drink. Read a good mystery novel. Take too much MDMA and pee in your slacks. Sit in an empty room and cry. Do anything but waste 26 euros on the Berlin Biennial. So this was, uh, Mr. Vaughn did not like this Biennale that much. Um, and, and I think that this particular um, statue and, and sculpture had kind of become a, an icon for, for the problems that he expressed in this particular review. Um, so Documenta, is a, this, is, this falls under the quinquennial um, category, but it's a five-year biennial, um, and Documenta has in, it's a headier show, um, but it's in the past it suffered from bad management, lack of purpose, and squandered use of copious funding. So it's had quite, quite a few problems. Um, one of the th sort of interesting things that happens with um, this headier biennial is that sometimes curators take a central stage. Um, so you can see the press shots for Documenta 13 curator. Um, it, this, is, this was the, the curator from 2013, and they are completely bizarre. These shots became memes online. You can see in one, it looks like she's kind of somewhat possessed by um, an art alien that is going to force her into art speak. Um, and then there's another picture where she's hiding behind a tree for no apparent reason. So th it's not a surprise that this sort of became so, uh, uh, something of derision. Um, anyway, to quote the uh, Guardian art critic Adrian Searle, words in any case are never the biennial strong point, although there are always a great number of them. Um, and so that is something that has definitely plagued the Venice Biennale. Um, it certainly has plagued Documenta with a kind of art speak that I, I feel can be very alienating um, and does not benefit uh, public interaction, and it, it certainly became a problem in this particular version, uh, this this latest documenta. Um, w when asked whether art needs to look good, Adam, uh, uh, I don't really know how to say his last name, Seismic, um, he's the curator, answered, if you think aesthetics is akin 
is more akin to cosmetics as a pretty thing. I suppose this can be useful sometimes, but we're more interested in texture and the structure. You could have just said no, like this is, but this is kind of wrapping things up um, in a way to exaggerate its importance. So, um, let's see. This was a, so Documenta had a budget of roughly 40 million, um, and the Quinquennial is a, um, a publicly funded event. So just for context, the NEA in the United States has a budget of 180 million, um, which may be reduced to nothing after um, the Republicans are, are done with things, but uh, that's, this is, that's sort of where we're starting with it. Their budget for one event is a quarter of the United States budget for the entire uh, year of uh, their arts funding. Um, so the, the exhibition went over budget by nearly $8 million due to mismanagement. Um, the curator won the artistic uh, director position with his proposal that he would transport the collection of the cash-strapped Athens Museum of Contemporary Art to Castle. So this was sort of, this was the big thing that, that got him the job in the first place. But the promise was that it would only take up to 10% of the budget to do so. When it went over, the, the you know, Seismic threatened to resign if the Athens Museum was cut. So, Meanwhile, transporting the collection from Athens, which as we all know had m many a debt problems and was sort of at a point where if you wanted to take cash out of the ATM, you could only take 150 bucks out at a time. Meanwhile, a lot of shippers were only accepting cash for shipping. So what happened was that shippers was that employees of Documenta were carrying, and even interns were carrying bags of cash to Athens to get the stuff shipped with as much money as 10K in a bag. So, and all this for a show that was universally panned, pretty much. So this is a good example of what happens when you try to do too much with the money you're given. Um, because I, I've never really figured out why this, um, other than sort of the spectacle of moving this collection, why it was necessary to do it. So um, anyway, moving right along, uh, Prospect One also fits in the, within the context of citywide biennales or biennials. Uh, Prospect One, um, this was a, a biennial founded in New Orleans af by Dan Cameron um, after the Katrina hurricane disaster. So remember how we looked at that, um, that little cartoon by Olaf Westphalen that says what we need, what our village needs now is a biennial? This is someone who took that literally. And What's great about that, though, is so did everybody else. Everybody who participated in this biennial believed that art could make a difference. And what happened was kind of incredible. What happened was the best biennial I've ever been to. It had purpose and a lot of borrowed money. After this biennial, it almost went bankrupt. Uh, so <laughs> there's a, there is some downsides to the, to the management end of Prospect. But um, this is a, a piece by Nari Ward. Um, you can hear like clips of Martin Luther King speaking. You can hear clips of um, sounds from the community. You can, um, but there's also this kind of uh, it's just moving, slow but 
moving soundtrack behind it that made this whole experience feel very special. And what's inside of that, like sort of um, those walls that are papered with uh, posters is this uh, diamond, uh, what he calls a diamond gym, but he's taken recycled um, uh, parts from workout gear that he um, took from uh, the former office of Al Sharpton up in Harlem trans uh, transported them down to New Orleans and made this kind of abstract workout gear. And it's like, you know, I think you could, you might, you might think about it as like maybe like workout gear for an enfeebled population. And if you think about it that way, you know, maybe it seems like a little hokey, but when you're in this space and you hear that music and you see the water line around the, the building, which is a former church that's been deserted, you just, you can't help but feel moved. It was, it was really one of the best things I, I'd seen in so long and I think that it's, you know, of the works that I saw in Prospect, you know, you always see hundreds of works, but I would say that at least five of them I sort of, I believe should be remembered as some of the most important works of the 20th century, 21st century. The, the idea that you could say that of for that many works in one exhibition is just kind of mind-blowing to me. You know, I see thousands of works, artworks every year. I mean, I can't even count how many I see. So, um, let's see. Um, and another really powerful piece, I'm not gonna play the whole thing here, but this was a Waiting for Good, Godot by Paul Chan, which also played in, well, as a performance in New Orleans. Waiting for Godot has come to New Orleans. Can you turn up the volume? Is it possible? Because you can't up, hear it. There's really no point in playing this. Still waiting for help two years after Hurricane Katrina and Rita. Samuel Beckett set his 1952 masterpiece in a desolate, unnamed landscape. This weekend and next, it will be staged for free in New Orleans' Lower Ninth Ward and Gentilly neighborhood. Eve Trow reports. Actor Wendell Pierce, best known as Detective Bunk on Thank HBO's you. The Wire, has been in New Orleans for almost a month, rehearsing his role as Vladimir. Let us not waste our time with idle discourse. Let us do something while we have the chance. It's not every day that we are needed. Not indeed that we personally are needed. Others might meet the case equally well, if not better. To all mankind were just those cries for help still ringing in our ears. But at this place, at this moment in time, all mankind is us, whether we like it or not. Let us make the most of it while we have the chance. Pierce grew up in New Orleans. He was able to evacuate his parents before Katrina hit. New York artist Paul Chan visited New Orleans for the first time a year after the hurricane. Chan looked around at the devastated houses and people and couldn't help but think of waiting for Godot. The sense of waiting is legion here. People are waiting to come home, waiting for the levee board to okay the levee so they can start rebuilding again, waiting for honest construction crews who won't rip them off, and what people do while they wait, right? They banter jokes, they keep themselves busy and entertained, and it's a form of keeping hope alive, I think. Samuel Beckett's play has been performed at San Quentin Prison. In South Africa, Godot suggested waiting for the end of apartheid. Susan Sontag staged it in Sarajevo in 1993, in the midst of war. And so all these things conspired to put us within a lineage of imagining what it means to create art in places where we ought not have any. Paul Chan needed part... Anyway, you kind of get a sense of what that was. It was a really... Um, powerful piece. It was a performance that took place in the streets of New Orleans um, and it really had a profound impact uh, on um, you know the viewers and the residents. It, it really spoke to them. Um, and the other, another very iconic piece is Mac, uh, Mark Bradford's uh, Mira, which is this giant arc that was made out of uh, 
um, f foraged uh, um, like boards from construction sites and things like that. So this was uh, um, a simply massive piece that uh, um, really had a tremendous impact. And it's probably worth mentioning that when you see this in person, when I saw this in person, this is like literally in the middle of nowhere. Like all of this stuff has, like the homes around it have been flattened or if they still exist, they're, they're, they're really dilapidated. All you could see was the effects of the hurricane. So to have this ship here really like I think meant something. So Prospect 4, this is four years later. Uh, there's, or not four years later, four iterations later. Prospect 4 is now a triennial. Um, there's no hurricane, so there's a little bit less of a reason for a purpose. Um, they're chronically underfunded, and they uh, consistently have poor organization. Um, so this is an a install shot from the New Orleans Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, this is a piece by Rad Radcliffe Bailey, which is um, in a place called Crescent Park. It's one of the pieces that's actually very beautiful there, and it's a seashell that's encased within a metal, uh, a metal shell itself, and you can go inside this, and like the, uh, the sounds that you might hear from hearing, from placing the shell up to your ear are amplified, so you walk into this thing, and it's like walking into the ocean. So that's a very simple and elegant gesture, but uh, this artist, Hong An Truong, to speak a language, um, this kind of looks like nothing. It's, um, it's also in Crescent Park. It has a sound element that's essential to understanding the work. You'll notice I'm not playing a video. That's because when I went to see it, it didn't work. Um, I happen to know the artist, so I'm sure she's mortified that I'm showing this, but uh, what can I do? Um, so I call, I, I texted her and I said, you know, do you know your, uh, has anybody talked to you about your work? Because I'm here on this press tour and like there's an on off switch, but we can't seem to get it to go on. And nobody had told her it wasn't working and nobody contacted her except for me. So this is a good example of a biennial that's set up to fail because the organization isn't good. Um, also, this particular artist and others were not given enough time to adequately make the work. So if you're not given enough time to do the work, then you're not gonna make very good work. So that goes to poor organization again. Like these are, they sound like basic things. The other problem with Prospect One is that you can never find a goddamn thing ever. They have a map. You'd think they put the artist's names on the map. There's no names for the artists on a map. You're traveling across the city. You can't f find what, what you need to find. So this is, you know, these are all good examples of, of, of why this is a problem. But, you know, bad management is part of it, but it's also bad, it's a, it's a lack of funding. Prospect didn't have enough money to, make a, to hire somebody to make a good app so that you could just get some, get to where you needed. And what happens is they also didn't have enough money to give the artists to make ambitious projects. So what happens is the artists are kind of set up to fail. You know, they don't have enough money, they don't have enough resources, they have to make these sort of small projects for an event of a vast scale. So the scale stops making sense. So that becomes a big problem. This is a, this is a piece, I'm still wondering about this. Basically, this is, there are bird sounds here. Um, this particular artist found non-indigenous birds, um, recorded them, put the soundtrack on a speaker, the speakers hung from that tree, and if you happen to recognize the sound of birds, that were not indigenous, you would recognize that there was an artwork there. It's in a park. There are birds chirping all the time. Like, all, like I was there with like 20 other journalists. Every single one of us is just like circling the fucking tree, trying to find the speakers. 
It was crazy. Anyway, Art Prize. So we're moving along here. This uh, Art Prize, let me just start out by saying Art Prize, not even a biennial. It happens every year. However, it happens every year, but it has purpose. It's, uh, it is a citywide event, so it looks a lot like a biennial. It has good management, and it has good funding, although the funding comes from very evil places. So you have to be very careful about this. Um, so Art Prize, how many of you out here know anything about Art Prize? Couple people. So Art Prize is a citywide competition. You vote on all the art you see. There is more art in our prize than almost any other biennial I've ever been to because everybody participates. If there is a coffee shop that can, put, can host some art, they do that. Every single museum in the city hosts art. So the Contemporary Museum of Grand Rapids, their entire programming for our prize is art prize artists. The entire city is on this. The entire population pretty much goes to the city central, like the art prize uh, offices, registers to vote, and then they vote on all the work. The work, doesn't matter who you are if you're an artist, if you got an artwork, you can submit it. And that's why there was a giant wooden Loch Ness monster in the river. This is a terrible work of art. It is really bad, and it's actually traveled since Art Prize, which makes my heart hurt a little bit, but this is what happens. So the thing is, is that this thing was a finalist, because you vote on the work, and at the end of the day, somebody wins a prize, and they win a lot of money. They win 250 bucks, 250,000 dollars, 250,000. <laughs> Big difference. <laughs> so they, they win 250,000 dollars for the grand prize. Um, there's also a juried prize. So this is kind of how I'm connected because I had been uh, invited to critique the jurors, um, which, I, which I did. But, um, so people get really into this. You can vote as many times as you like. Um, but at the end of the day, the, uh, the artwork that has the most votes is the artwork that represents the city. So Art Prize officials, they do everything they can to educate the public because they don't want this thing to be the mascot for the full year. And every year, they're terrified because the, art, the, the citizens kind of vote similarly. This is the crucifixion that won, um, I think, in 2009. My favorite thing about this was that a local blogger described this as a safe and non-controversial artwork because it was a mosaic. But I just thought, if I saw this in a... a contemporary art museum, the last thing I would use to describe it is safe and non-controversial. Every fucking critic in the city would tear this thing apart. This um, is sort of an interesting artwork though because this won the prize last year, I think, and it was the first, um, this was the first artwork to win both the public and the jury prize. Our prize has been around since 2009 and um, each year, the, the public artwork and the juried artwork has been a different winner. So this was sort of a big thing. The, the, so they do education and engagement and organization really well. They do funding really well, but the funding comes from this little family called the DeVos family. I don't know if you're familiar with Betsy DeVos, the new, a U.S. Uh, Secretary of Education who is looking to destroy every public school in the U.S. That's, who, that's the family that, that funded that. Her, her son came up with this. So the, uh, the programs director has been doing a lot of uh, explanation about why this, this prize still kind of works, even though um, it's attached to 
some evil money. Um, the other thing about this prize is that that, that makes it, I think, a little controversial, and this is something that's true of almost all biennials, is that because they're underfunded, they need somebody to, to bankroll some of the expenses. So in this case, nobody has a shipping budget. So it is the artist that is responsible for installing the work, shipping it from wherever it comes from, and making sure that, that it's installed properly, and, and all of the financial costs that that entails. So that means that if you're an artist and you're participating in our prize and you live in New York or you live in Toronto, like all of those shipping costs are yours. So that means that you're probably not bringing a big piece unless you manage to find some grant funding to do it. And that means that basically the, the exhibition costs are underwritten by the artists. Now, in larger biennials, the galleries will underwrite the costs, but the fact of the matter is that biennial institutions typically don't have the funds to underwrite the costs of shipping the artwork, which you would think is sort of an exhibition uh, cost, but because the, the sort of structure of funding is the way it is, um, in, in the art world, this becomes, you know, pretty much every organization is looking for ways to offset costs. So the museum-based format, um, these are exhibitions that take place within the confines of the museum. Um, the Whitney Biennial is probably the best example of this. Uh, it's got a purpose. The Whitney Biennial shows American art. It's a survey that happens every two years. Strong organization, some years better than others. They always have guest curators, but that's kind of the way that goes. Fairly consistent, consistent funding. It's a large institution. They have, um, this is their kind of marquee event. The board members make sure that it's funded. So typically those aren't the problems. That said, everybody loves to hate the Whitney Biennial. I don't know why, but, well, because usually it kind of sucks, but um, <laughs> it, it did move to a new building, so that solved some of their problems. Um, so this is a shot from the last uh, biennial, uh, oops, uh, which was organized by Christopher Liu and uh, Mia Lox. Uh, and, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Uh, this... You know, it was organized in 2016, but it did sort of bring political themes that, that seemed to be informing art to a boil, so I thought that it was sort of on the mark for that. Um, this is a William Pope L piece. You can't really see it that well, but these are like, these little bits here, they look like skin flesh or something, like flesh medallions. Um, so it's like, the whole thing looks like a torture room, but they're, it's actually baloney. So um, this thing here, right here, this is a trough that catches the grease from the bologna. Um, so, um, and then this is Dana Schutz's open casket. Um, this is another example of an artwork that does, is not benefited by its reproduction. Um, this was a, it, I'm gonna ask kind of a silly question, but how many people didn't, are, are unaware of the Dana Schutz controversy sur surrounding the open casket. Hands up. Okay, couple people. So what happened with this is that uh, this is a picture of Emmett Till. Emmett Till, um, I believe is 1950s, was uh, brutally murdered. Um, it was a racially uh, it was a racially motivated murder. His mother was so upset that when he was buried, um, he, was, he was buried with an uh, open casket. So, the, um, so he was photographed and his deformed face was, was photographed. And so this was, um, Dana Schutz took this image and reproduced it in painting. And this became a, like, a focal point for so much conversation. And 
because there was a big, there's a lot of questions over whether this was, Dana Schutz is a white woman. She said that she reproduced this, uh, this image in painting because she felt that, um, you know, as a mother, she, and with all the, the racially motivated violence, that this was something that she felt deeply troubled by. Um, but there were a lot of people who were really upset that believed that this was not a photograph that could be, um, that, that was meant to be reproduced. And what you can't tell here is that this entire face, this looks like a relatively flat painting, um, but what she did is she created this like really layered painting. So the paint came like right off the canvas. It was super thick. Um, you know, but it, there's definitely a lot of questions here as to whether this, whether it should have been painted because a lot of, like, this photograph exists in the African Museum uh, of Art in Washington, D.C. The entire museum uh, has been made open to the public. You can photograph everything except for that one photograph, which has its own room. So the choice to, because it's a very sensitive photograph, so the choice for her to use this particular image, I think, was upsetting to a lot of people, and there are good reasons for that. And the debate about this, though, lasted about a month. Um, and it was the first time that I saw debate kind of overshadow the debate on Facebook and social media. It overshadowed anything that, that I saw written, pretty much. So we're, we're, we're nearing the end here. Um, but the biennial is a marketing device. These are events designed specifically to draw attention to specific efforts. Uh, this is the Biennial of the Americas. Um, it suffered from problems like ulterior motives, disproportionate funding to non-events. Uh, the Art bi Biennial was underfunded. Uh, haphazard management. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit about this. Um, what does a biennial look like when it's run by a group of businessmen and politicians? If Denver's Biennial of the Americas is any indication, like some awful biennial-length Franken-conference in the service of multinational corporations, art, when it was given a place at all, was used primarily as a branding tool for the event. It was not surprising then that it had little to offer art lovers or profession business professionals. Even the biennials expressed aims, idea exchange, and looking to booming economies in the North and South weren't achieved. In the inaugural discussion forum, Unleashing Human Potential, the only time anyone looked to the North was when Google's Eric Schmidt, a panelist, observed that some of the snow was melting up in Canada, and that might reveal some new sources of revenue for the United States. He later proclaimed that poverty would be eliminated thanks to mobile devices, and he cited the, uh, the Huffington Post as a publishing model that might one day help writers get paid. The Huffington Post does not pay its writers. Needless to say, I started praying that the exchange of ideas would stop, and the biennial did its best to make sure that it would, whereas most exhibitions would host contemporary art that could spark exchange. This one blew its resources on high, panel, high profile panelists like the Daily Beast, Tina Brown, and the Huffington Post, Ariana Huffington. Art was so clearly an afterthought that half the audience had already left unleashing human potential before we were told we should sit back down because the organizers had forgotten to announce the cultural programming. That was a missed opportunity. So basically there's an entire biennial art biennial that was kind of used as a promotional material to promote like Google and like Comcast. So this is, this definitely fits in the category of most depressing biennials I have ever been to. Um, and the last one I wanted to talk about was local biennials. Um, and the local biennial I think is super important. Um, this is the Texas Biennial. 
I'm not even going to say this was a good biennial. It wasn't. But it was a biennial that needed to exist. Basically, uh, the curator, Leslie Moody Castro, curate, uh, she toured Texas, the state, for um, I think the better part of four months looking at studios and then put together this show. Um, the show was a little underfunded, but you know what didn't exist? Any kind of cohesive survey of the work that biennials, uh, that artists were doing in the state of Texas. So I thought it was a really good idea. Um, and I would add to that that one of the problems with Texas is that it's, it's massive. Um, so you kind of need a curator to, to travel around. And this biennial took place in one spot. So that kind of solved problems. There's a biennial that's planned to take place in Nashville, Texas, or Nashville, um, in Tennessee. And the thing about Tennessee is it's a very small state, and the cities are kind of close to each other. So it's going to be a state biennial that you can drive to, and that actually gets people connected. So there are purposes, local biennials with a purpose tend to do better. Um, and most local biennials do have a purpose. This is the backyard biennial. It's not a biennial. It's happened once. If it happens twice, I'd be surprised. A lot of times what happens is that artists, they like, you know, they do these events and you do them as, kind of, as long as they feel urgent to you. And that's kind of what's great about these artist projects, because with biennial, sometimes institutions kind of surround a biennial to the extent that, like, they go on, like in the case of Prospect, they go on well beyond their expiration date. In, with an artist, they just do it till they get tired of it. This is like the backyard biennial, like this took place in somebody's backyard. This list of artists, it was mostly a slideshow. Like, the, <laughs> it's, it's pretty small. However, it was a great community event. It got a lot of people together who were photographers that weren't introduced before, and I thought it was fantastic for what it was. Small, great, and it was a good way to get, it was just a branding, it was another, kind of branding exercise, but this one I felt was like, you know, it wasn't in service of Comcast. They've got their own budget for advertising. Like, they don't need a biennial to attach to anything they do. Whereas, you know, a small independent artist might need that. The same thing with the Bushwick, Bushwick biennial, which took place, this was two, this one took place for two years before it crapped out. This was uh, uh, Julian de Ballancourt, who was a pretty well-known, successful artist. So he was at Ven the Venice Biennale, but all his friends in Bushwick weren't able to participate. So he said, well, why don't we have a local biennial while the Venice Biennale is going on, and we'll get some press for ourselves. So it was really successful. Um, and that, you know, I think this was something that was done on a shoestring budget, but it came together because of the, the blood and sweat and tears um, hopefully not that many tears from, you know, by, by the artists who, who organized it. And, you know, the, the last biennial, and I'm not really going to talk about it, but I did feel like it was important to mention um, that, you know, we're all here, or I'm here, because I'm, I'm, I was asked by a biennial organization to come and speak about biennials. Um, so, Kafka was, they have a biennial that happens every two years and, you know, it brings people together. It has the opportunity to introduce uh, local artists and international artists to a larger audience. And, you know, I just, I want to leave on this note and I'm going to say that nobody asked me to say this, but the most important thing we can do for these large events is make sure that they're well-funded. And, you know, we're all here. This is a great opportunity to... Kafka is a, 
is, a, is an organization that offers a great opportunity to introduce us to new artists and to introduce um, local artists to larger audiences. So what I think we should do is we should support them. So we should support Kafka financially when we can, and I think we sh should support them with our labor and our love.